What are antiparticles? So I'm going to wrap up with this. Because you can now understand it. everything I've told you. It's not easy to understand that idea. There's one thing you have to understand, though. Electron, two electrons cannot be put in the same physical state at the same time. It's called the exclusion principle. Electrons have spin, they have little tops. They can spin in one of two ways, up or down. You can't put two up electrons in the same place at the same time. Why not? It's called the exclusion principle. And actually, with a little more time, I can explain that to you too. But we see it in atoms. So the hydrogen atom has an electron, and that electron spin up. Now you go to helium. There's a second electron in the lowest orbit. And it has to go in like that. It can't go in like that. It's disallowed. Once you get helium, you've got two electrons in what's now called a closed shell. Can't put another electron in. That's why helium is chemically inert. In order for things to be chemically active, electrons have to be able to jump back and forth from one guy, one atom's orbital to another. Helium has a closed orbital. Now you go to lithium, and you got a, two electrons in the inner orbital. You've got to add a third electron, and it has to go into a different orbital. It's called a P wave or a 2S wave. And you can start filling those up, and this explains the structure of the periodic table beautifully. Now, why do electrons have this so-called exclusion principle? Um, well, it's weird. I don't have the time to do it just yet. But if anybody wants to hear this story later, if you're, if you're, I, I shouldn't say this because Eric has points to it. It's not hard to explain it, but it's not worth doing it for me. Let's, just, let's understand that I matter first. Take one step at a time. But you have to know this fact. Haven't you been taught the exclusion principle in your chemistry classes? Yeah. yeah. So you know this is a fact. It's a real physical fact. So Galileo understood motion this way. He said, a moving guy has a different coordinate system. Carrying with him, he carries an x-axis and a time axis, a clock. And so he's moving along. His origin of his axis is moving with him. So he measures things relative to where he is. The stationary person has an x-axis and measures positions relative to that. The calibration between the moving guy and the stationary guy is this formula. And all this says is that if you're moving and there's a tree outside the window of your train that you're sitting on that is at some fixed value of x, and you're moving at velocity v, you're going to see that tree changing its position x prime with time. That's, that's the tree of passive. That formula says that. But you're not going to notice the time has changed. And that was, that's called the Galilean transformation. And it is a symmetry of, of physics provided the velocities are small compared to the speed of light. In relativity, however, things change. And this is something I told you at the beginning when we looked at the sphere or the circle. What Einstein realized is that the speed of, see, Galileo, his transformation predicts that the speed of light is changing. <coughs> If I launch a, a particle of light, I'll measure it going away from me at the speed of light, c. If I'm moving after it, Galileo's transformation would predict that I'll see c minus v for the photon. And if I can move fast enough, I should bring that photon at rest relative to me. And I should even be able to overtake it. That's a prediction of Newtonian or Galilean relativity. But the experiments weren't, weren't, weren't telling us this. The famous Michelson-Morley experiment told us that if you chase after light, its speed is still c. Einstein supposedly didn't know this experimental fact, but he was looking at Maxwell's equations, which describe photons and all that. And he asked, what's the symmetry of Maxwell's equations? And he found the symmetry was that the speed of light didn't change. And what he concluded is the following. If you have two events, like this can be a a photographic bulb going off, emitting light. And here's a detector, an eyeball out here. The light is emitted at x equals 0, t equals 0. And at a later time, t, the light is received at a position x. Einstein said there's a distance between those two events in space-time. And he called it tau. And he said tau squared is c squared t squared minus x squared. And the reason he did that is for those events for which tau is 0. If tau is 0, 
That means c squared t squared minus x squared equals zero, which means x equals plus or minus ct. That's just the light going out at the speed of light. So if you have a flash bulb going off here, I don't have a picture of this, no, I don't. Light will be emitted and move away at the speed of light. Okay. Einstein said all observers, no matter how they're moving, have to have the same equation of motion for light. And therefore, the moving observer who's carrying a coordinate system x prime and t prime must conclude that the distance between the events is tau the same tau. And when tau is zero, they will conclude that x prime equals plus or minus c t prime. Light moves just the same way. So Einstein said, what is the transformation between x and t into x prime and t prime that leaves these equations in that form, in the same form? And he discovered this. x prime is given by, like Galileo would have said, <coughs> x minus vt, but there's a prefactor here, gamma. And gamma is a function of v divided by c, and it's 1 over the square root of 1 minus e squared over c squared. It's sort of like cosine theta and sine theta. And t prime is now changed. Galileo would have said t prime equals t. But Einstein found that t prime is gamma times t minus vx over c. Notice if c goes to infinity, gamma goes back to 1, and this term disappears, and you get back exactly Galileo, x minus vt. That's the correct relationship <coughs> between motion and stationary observers. Your homework is just to take those formulas and verify. And then if you substitute, this is easy. No, this is easy. It's just like the trig problem. Substitute this and this into this, and it'll reduce back to that. It's a little bit of algebra. This is called the Lorentz transformation. That called the Einstein transformation. Lorentz had kind of guessed a little bit before this. Now, this is what happens. Do I have it, like three more minutes? Uh, no, probably not. All right. The relationships between energy and momentum are modified. And what happens is this is the Newtonian formula. And Einstein gets a new formula. And he has to take the square root of E squared to get the energy. And that gives him E equals MC squared. But you can get two signs. Well, I've got to just wrap this up in one minute. You get a minus sign, too, because you get a square root. And then the negative energy solutions. And, but there are no negative energy electrons. And Dirac figured that the vacuum is all filled up by the helium atom. All the states are filled up that have negative energy. So it can only be positive energy electrons. Then he realized if you kick up an electron out of the vacuum, you have an electron with positive energy and the absence of a negative energy electron called a hole, and that's called an anti-electron. And this is the origin of antimatter. And in fact, if I spent a little more time, you'd understand why I had to modify its symmetry. The relationship between energy and momentum has to be more symmetrical than it is for uh, Newton has a very asymmetrical relationship between energy and momentum. Einstein makes a more symmetrical one because of the symmetry of space. So anyway, that's it, and, and I'm going to turn you over to your tours. Here's the anti-electron for the first time it was discovered, and that's the book.